never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around. Hi guys, welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Another fantastic day for an interview. Yes, I've got Adam Peters with me. Adam is a man who has been serving his country in the United States for a hell of a long time and then found himself, well, on the receiving end for a lot of challenges, including one of the biggest challenges. How do you reinvent yourself when you come out of a, a very institutionalized and, and you know, a regimented kind of way? And how do you now go into city street? And how do you actually find purpose in your life when suddenly all the, those things that you took for granted and that were so clear for you as goals are suddenly no longer there. And that is a story for so many men. But it's not just veterans going into city street. It is so many men who have to pivot on a dime because they have lost their jobs with COVID or they have lost their job in yet another financial crisis or their country burns up in a new civil war. There are so many, so many constant challenges out there that require resilience, yet we often get caught out and we often find ourselves with coping mechanisms that are outdated and they came from previous traumas. And we find ourselves with ways of behaving that actually eh, are not so productive and even worse, ways of thinking and feeling that are guaranteed to make you make the wrong choices. Let's call it broadly like that. So. Adam, I'm so grateful that you're here. Let's deep dive into a discussion that really matters about PTSD, TBI, about all those things that men try to hide and men try to be real men. No, no, that's fine. No, no, I'm all, I'm all good. Bullshit. <laughs> Adam, welcome yeah. to my show. <laughs> Thank you for having me, man. I'm super grateful to be here and I'm really excited to have a conversation with you, my friend. <laughs> man, how long have you been in the army? And was that something that you always wanted to do or was it just fate that that got you into the army? Man, no, I was in the army for 13 years from June of 03 to uh, November of 2015. So I've been out the better part of a decade now. Um, it was not something that I always wanted to do. I grew up in small town, Indiana, and I knew there was more to the world. So for me, it was a way out. Um, the army, the army was a way out. And, and that's that's how I ended up where I'm at now, you know, um, not, you know, I, I did have a, a history of my grandfather was a World War II medic, my uncle served in two deployments to Vietnam. So I did have some influence there, but um, never really saw it in my future until mm -hmm. you know, high school and and wanted wanted out. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to work on the farms. And mm. I knew there was a whole lot of world to see out there. So uh, that's what I did. I joined at 17 years old and the rest is history, my friend. <laughs> was it a good time for you? You know, it was it was a mixed bag. Um, I love the army uh, a lot, a lot, probably a lot more than I should. Um, but uh, but you know, it had its times, right? It had some really, really terrible times, particularly when I first got in. And then, you know, it was some of the best times of my life, you know, during, during, and then, you know, some, some really bad times as you're getting out. So, you know, it was, it was a mixed bag, but overall, um, I'm super grateful that, that I lived that life and had those experiences for sure. Mm. I mean, there is this brotherhood of men and women who are uh, especially once you 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 go through really hard times let that be the start of your training or let that be uh deployments uh that is really where most people say wow this was really so important to me and i'll accept that but i mean you have been in the army in the u.s army where there has been a huge change um, that was developing a complete new kind of warfare that really uh, where the, the, the classic Cold War uh, was not preparing the army um, 
if at all, there was after the Soviet Union, uh, everything was sort of scaled down. Uh, people were thinking, well, we don't need an army anymore. <laughs> and then, oh, surprise, surprise, 9-11 uh, <laughs> came along, Iraq came along. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe we, we need something. And then suddenly everything changed with asymmetrical warfare and different roles. Was that confusing for you? Because with different rules of engagement, constantly changing so, on the battlefield. Yeah, so that's, I've never been asked this question. It's really interesting because I got to witness a lot of that change firsthand. So when I first came into the army, it was very much the co conventional style of warfare, preparing for an invasion, typical normal tactics that have been around for hundreds of years, right? And on that first deployment, as you're training up, you do an NTC rotation to become qualified to actually deploy as a unit. And we we did the conventional stuff there, but then you get over to Iraq and you're not at all doing conventional operations. So you're learning on the fly. You're, you're really kind of inventing tactics as you go. And you're, uh, the better question in all of that is the ROE changes. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a ton of feelings about all of that. I think when politics get involved, uh, you know, it's not really good for the war machine or whatever, but I did, I watched the ROE change for every single deployment I did. And I did four of them as a conventional infantryman. So I have like 49 months of combat time. And, you know, I, I my first deployment, the ROE was pretty simple. Anybody out after curfew, anybody on a motorcycle or anybody on a cell phone no questions asked it was that was it and then it would change to you know by the end of my afghanistan deployment in 2012 basically our hands were tied behind our backs and we couldn't do anything until we were actively being attacked um shot at whatever that looked like mortar didn't matter so you you couldn't even do any kind of i could watch them you know, plant an IED, I could watch them blow up an IED, I could watch them hang a mortar. And if it wasn't aimed at me or the unit, then there's nothing you could do about it. So uh, that's, that's a really good question, man. And, mm. and I did, I experienced all of it, that whole evolution. Mm. The reason I'm asking that is that if I am putting myself now into your body, and have to fight with my hands bound behind my back, I would find that a huge betrayal because they're playing with my life. They're playing with the life of my brothers and sisters around me. They're playing with the lives of the Iraqi, of Afghanistan civilians, because the amount of collateral damage, they don't give a damn if their mortar is, is, is well, they want to be it on target. The, you know, most of them will not be. And then they end up, you know, bombing a house with 20 civilians behind you. So yes. it is, that is the reality. And I would have great difficulties with that feeling of betrayal. How did you deal with, with that? I mean, this is powerlessness, I, isn't it? You know, I, I don't think I ever dealt with it while I was still in. Um, it's not something I really dealt with until the last couple of years in the transformation and the healing journey that I've started over the last year. Mm. You just, you just, you're just a, you're just a robot soldier, man. You're brainwashed, you follow orders and you just do the job because you don't have any other choice. Mm. You know, it's, it's really, I know it's cliche, but it's, it's go to war or go to jail. Like mm. that's, that's pretty much the rules, right? Like you're not really going to go to jail, but you're, you're going to get a bunch of extra duty, lose some rank and some pay. And it's just not worth disobeying orders because you feel betrayed or whatever. I think we just kind of realized it was what it was. However, the caveat to that is being out. Yeah, definitely feels like a betrayal. And it's confusing because I love that organization so much. It's responsible for so much positive in my life, but also mm -hmm. so much negative in my life. So how, how do I handle that betrayal? I just have to see it for what it was. It's not mm -hmm. something that happened to me. It's something that happened for me and there's lessons to be learned in it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I try to see those lessons for what they are and, and, you know, take the good and, and the, the bad stuff that doesn't serve me in any way, shape or form. I just have to let it go. I can't change it. That's what you say now. But I mean, here <laughs> we are 10, 10 years after you 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 changed uh, from from one uniform to another. Uh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that is a long healing journey there. I bet. 
Yeah. The reason yeah. I say that, we, the reason I'm, I'm asking along these lines is because here we are, we nowadays know how important uh, adverse childhood experiences are, the aces in our life, how they yes. influence the way we see the world, how we perceive the world, how we easily get triggered. So here, and I haven't even started with your childhood, but I'm sure there, there were some things that, that were not so nice. So we've got all this this history of of uh, warped coping mechanisms, and with that I mean the heightened fight and flight, the uh, pleasing behaviors, um, the sometimes the dissociation and the fawning, different trauma behaviors. But they continue, and many people keep forgetting that that something like the the chaos that you have experienced in those moments when you actually were um, at risk for your life, even if you were not blown up, and even if there was not an immediate mortar raining down and killing your body, hang on, this is your body perceives that as a life and death threat. I mean, how better can you create PTSD? How better can you? I mean, if, you, if I wanted to create a model, how to, to really fuck someone up? Well, that would be it, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because all of that stuff perpetuates those behaviors that we developed as children through whatever childhood generational trauma. And I think we're we're discovering that more and more every day, right? Like as we have conversations like you and I are having, we'll, we're understanding that, you know, particularly in the military, the veteran community, it's not so much the trauma of war that they need to deal with. It's childhood trauma, really. Mm -hmm generational childhood trauma very very wise very wise so we've got these these layers of trauma there but i mean you had no clue about childhood trauma when uh you came out of the military but you had the added trauma on top of it how was it for you to to get out was oh there, man it was was there was at that the time worst. help there was, uh, I mean, no, no, there, there's still not uh, a lot of good help. So, so I, I want to kind of paint a picture of, of really how you get out of the military. So you either are in my case, I was med boarded, which means I had injuries. I can no longer fit for duty. You know, just didn't meet the requirements to be a soldier anymore. So mm -hmm. they, they medically retired me, which means I get VA disability. And, and basically I'm just, I'm still a retired soldier. I just never made it to the 20 years to get official retirement, or you can just simply ETS, which is just get out. And really there's a program. It was called a cap army career assistance program. When I went out, I think now it's called SFL tap. I've been out for, like I said, the better part of a decade. So I'm not familiar with the program, but it was a joke. When I got out, there was no, they just throw a bunch of stuff at you and hand you a bunch of papers and try to explain as best they can, how things like insurance and all of that work when you get out mm -hmm. and they really kind of, their claim to fame is they teach you how to write a resume. And then they're like, Hey, use your GI bill, go to college, get a degree. Good luck. And that's pretty much how you get out. So there is no help. Um, there's no emotional help. There's no mental health help. There's no, you know, physical help, spiritual help or social help. They don't really do anything to set you up for success. So mm -hmm. getting out for me, particularly because I was a lifer, I would have probably still been in today if, if I hadn't been med boarded, which would make me at my 22nd year. Um, so I was, I was pretty distraught, man. I had lost basically my entire sense of identity and purpose. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who I was without the army. So, you know, what are infantry guys good at? They are good at falling into the bottom of a bottle. And uh, I <laughs> fell into the bottom of that bottle really, really hard uh, for a for a good period of time. And uh, it wasn't pretty, man. I spent a lot of money and hurt a lot of people and alienated a lot of relationships in my life because of it. Damn. How long did that period last? It's tough to say because I don't think I really realized or wanted to admit that I was having substance abuse problems or that I was an alcoholic mm. or that I was coping in negative ways. Mm. If I had to guess, you know, 
I say it lasted a long time, but I, I think putting it into perspective will help probably somewhere between 18 and 24 months, but that was 18 to 24 months of literally drinking every day. I was going through Seagram seven and seven up seven and seven was my drink of choice. I was going through two half gallons a week of Seagram seven, just at my house. Seagram seven every, is that kind of, is that a whiskey or is that? It's a cheap, yeah, it's a bottom of the barrel. It's like a well whiskey. I, okay. you know, it is what it is. It's okay. cheap. It was so about 40% time, alcohol. Um, I, I think, yeah, something like that. But yeah, yeah. I think at the time it was like 16 bucks for a half a gallon. Right. So right. I'm going for the cheap stuff because I'm just trying to, to escape from, from really just life in general and, and everything that's going on. But not only that, but I would go to the bar every night at nine o'clock and I would close it every single night. And I did that for like 18 months. So it got pretty bad, man. It got pretty bad. Well, that would have eaten up pretty much all your resources financially, isn't it? A absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. To the tune of like $30,000. My point, uh, yeah. It, That's it, about and, much. and people, like what you don't understand about it is like I wanted to feel better about myself, so I would buy people drinks as well. Of it wasn't course. like I was just buying myself <laughs> drinks, right? Like so, so it's really easy as an alcoholic to make friends because if you just buy everybody at the bar drinks, you always have somebody to drink with and then you lie to yourself and tell you you don't have a problem. <laughs> nice so said. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, and that that was that was very much my reality at 29 or 30 years old. Did it work? Did it work at that moment in time? Were you able to escape your reality? Or no, absolutely not. No, hmm. absolutely not. I, I I think I think in the moment, you know, as you you keep drinking and you get the head change and then, you know, you get the little floaty sensation throughout your body and then you start stumbling around and then I would go even further and I would be blacked out every night more more often than not. I mean, I'm a bigger guy, so, you know, and tolerance is a real thing. So, you know, then there's that natural progression where you just have to drink so much more to even do what you're doing. So, you know, hindsight's 2020. No, it didn't uh, work. It? Uh, in the moment, yeah, maybe I thought it was working because I'm now inebriated and well, we all get a little happy when we drink, right? Like, so, you know, I, I didn't perpetuate any anger until it did. You know, um, but for the most part, I think, yeah. I think, he, quote unquote, yes, it worked because, you know, for those few hours hanging out with people that I was buying drinks for, I was what I would call happy or at least mm -hmm. some semblance of happiness. Or at least distracted. Disassociated. I, that's, that's the, that's the better word. Yeah. I think Very so. Yes, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. Yes. Because I mean, that is that because we all are the same. I mean, it is. And, and some of these coping mechanisms are accepted in our society and are actually even encouraged. If you think about uh, sugar, uh, oh, yeah, let's have a donut, let's have a whatever it is. You know, there's nothing different there. It's just as bloody addictive as cocaine. If you look at, at the various things, why do you think there is sugar in, in absolute every ultra uh, processed food? And then you look at the, the amount of screen time that so many of us are using. We're just trying to escape. We're trying to escape yes. our reality. And, and, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes mm -hmm. you need to do that. Sometimes you, you, it is just too much. And if you have not yet learned how to sit with your emotions and how to nurture yourself and practice radical self-compassion, big words, guys, but there are, we come to that because no doubt Adam and me have done some work here. Um, if you are not yet there, what's the alternative? The alternative, and, and everyone out there listening, please understand that, that none of the addicts that you maybe have in your life, none of the, the people who are where you say, oh, why do you do that? Why? Because the pain is so huge. The pain that these people feel at that moment in time for a number of reasons is so huge that you can you can barely handle it and often enough you can't handle it and then you've got rage and then you've got shame and you've got guilt not all, all that shit happening all at the same time it's yeah. often very very brutal but 
I mean, yes, we have run away with the alcohol. And I mean, I stopped drinking 10 years ago. Um, you, what made you change? I mean, you had these so, 18 months of purgatory. Let's call, it tw let's call it two years, round figures. Two years of purgatory. Why would you suddenly stop? Did you run out of money? No, actually, <laughs> no, I, I didn't run out of money. Um, surprisingly, because I, I haven't been the best with money my entire life. You know, that's that's also <laughs> another story. But uh, really what it, what it was, so um, to give your audience or, or the listeners or whatever we're supposed to refer to them as um, some perspective who may not be familiar with the United States, I was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington at the time, which is the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest corner of the United States. And my dad lived down here in Florida where I currently live. Um, so in the Southeast corner of the United States. So I would only see my dad once every few years, just based on time and how expensive it is to, to fly out here. And I'll be the first to admit, I am a daddy's boy. My dad is my hero. Uh, my dad is not part of my childhood trauma issues that I had to deal with. In fact, I think that he was a pillar, um, and I just didn't realize it at the time for wow. you know, kind of a beacon of hope for me. But I had come down here to Florida to visit my dad. My dad, and I didn't know this at the time either, my, my grandfather, so my dad's dad, the World War II medic, had alcohol problems. My dad also uh, had alcohol problems. And my stepmom also had alcohol problems. So my dad has been sober for like 22 years. Um, mm -hmm. And I knew coming down here, uh, that I couldn't drink while I was down here for a week because I'm not coming down here for two days to fly across the country. Like that's just, it's just absurd. So I just made a whole week long trip and I had snuck little airplane bottles that I bought at the PX <laughs> in my bag, thinking I'm being sly also to battle the withdrawals that I know that I'm going to have to go through. Right. Uh, and so I, I had brought enough where I could do like one in the morning, one at lunch and one at you know, before dinner, after dinner, before bed to just kind of keep me from just really all out withdrawing. And at the end of that week, my dad dropped me off at the airport and, you know, typical get out to give me a hug or whatever, tell me he loves me. And he looked me dead in my eyes and my dad's six feet. I'm six, three. So he kind of looking up a little bit, but he said, son, and tears started falling down his face. And he said, I love you very much, but you need to quit drinking because you're killing yourself. And I think this is the first time I realized I had a real problem because I walked right into Orlando International Airport. I went right through security. And the first thing I did was sit down at the bar and order a double seven and seven. And I would continue to drink for about another three or four weeks before I woke up in the morning. I'm a very routine oriented person go you know, get up, go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, start the shower, get ready for my day. I got in the shower one morning and I started throwing up dark red blood. And I was like, okay, it's time to quit. Like I have my father begging me practically in tears to stop drinking because I'm killing myself. And I didn't believe him or I didn't want to hear it or I wasn't ready to receive it or uh, one of a million other fucking excuses I could give you. But Genuinely, I just, I was just being an asshole and just didn't want to heed serious advice. And uh, so when that morning when I threw up, that was it. I, I told myself I'll have one last hurrah tonight and tomorrow it's completely over. And I quit. I quit cold turkey on my own. I actually bought a PlayStation 4 and a video game. I locked myself in my apartment for 90 days, did not come out, turned my phone off, went through all of the withdrawals myself with no medical assistance, didn't know anything about alcohol withdrawals other than you would get them, didn't know that they could kill you. Um, but, but that's how I quit drinking. Yep. That's brutal. I mean, that's our uh, guys. Um, I've written in depth about well, alcohol withdrawals. I was lucky never to have experienced a full blown uh, thing. I mean, but yeah, close enough. I mean, there was some some sympathetic storm going on in me when I stopped drinking in in rehab. My blood pressure was high, um, and that is sort of one of the, the minor signs of a withdrawal. Um, uh, don't try that at home, kids. Is no, the very first thing I want to say. That. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because there I are. I second that. Yeah, that's right. Just, just get my book and, and just read the different versions of how you get through that. Um, but bottom line is, wow. I mean, I take my hat off to you, man. 
Um, this is this is beautiful to hear that. This is so wonderful to uh, first of all, uh, fuck, I want to I want to reach out to you and I want to give you a huge bear hug. OK, I want to give you a, I want to squeeze you and don't let you go, for man, because that is that that what you went through is huge and you could have easily continued because ultimately us drinking to that level is committing suicide in installments. You don't yes, even sir. have to pull a trigger. You don't even have nope. to do to take tablets. You just keep going the way you are. And that's it. So this would have been a way out. Um, maybe your subconscious knew that. Maybe it was planning so. on that. I think so. I mean, and... I could look at pictures of myself from back then and pale eyes sunken in, mm -hmm. heavier than I should be because of all the sugar and the alcohol. Um, you know, just don't look very good at all. Like mm. you'll really do kind of look like death walking around generally. Like, and mm. there's not a few, a whole lot of pictures of me that exist from that time in my life. Um, because I don't know. I think, I think I, I think you're right. I think subconsciously I knew what I was doing. I, mm. I really do. Mm. Oh man. I'm, I'm so pleased that your dad did the right thing. Uh, he was telling you, I love you. I think that is the, the biggest thing because yeah. hate the addiction, but love the addict. I think that is the, the important bit. We, and well, and I, th I think something else too, I, I don't choose to, to identify as an addict. I kind of look at it as experiencing addiction because if if we if we classify ourselves as addicts then that's a label that we put on ourselves that will mm. stick with us forever but if we choose to look at it as i'm experiencing addiction to alcohol at this mm. season of my life mm. it gives you the power back and mm. it really mm. and this is all stuff that i have learned you know, in the last year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. So please don't think that I had all this figured mm -hmm. out when I was going through it. But, <laughs> but I feel like it's relevant yeah. to share that because yeah. don't label yourself an addict, just understand that you're experiencing addiction and that will give you your power back to beat it. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing you just said. I just wrote an article on my website on that, the power of I am. When you say I am, that is actually a command to your subconscious, to those levels of your brain that are taking commands quite easily and say, okay, you are an addict. Okay, what do I have to do in addict? Oh yeah, okay. And your brain will do it. If you say, I am a victim, why me, why me? Your brain will give you answers. 20 reasons why you are a failure, 20 reasons why you are not lovable, 20 reasons why you're a piece of shit. I, it's, that's what your brain does. It is a very good computer. So maybe if we start rephrasing our questions and if we start having discussions where we challenge our understandings, where we challenge those thoughts and feelings that are essentially bullshit. I yes, am a sir. failure. I am not lovable. Look at me. I'm 57. I'm fat. I'm old. I'm I could go on forever because that's the that's the nasty voices in my head. Yeah. Is that really true? And how do we do do we deal with these voices when you had these voices in and yes, out? Sir. What did you do? The truth, um, I wallowed in it for a lot longer than I should have. Um, July 2nd of 2023, I I got the wonderful opportunity to get picked up by Heroic Hearts Project, which is a veterans nonprofit. They sent me to Terrapoto, Peru for a week-long ayahuasca retreat. And oh, wow. that's what changed everything for me, literally changed everything. And I'm, I'll tell you right now, I've lost 97 pounds in the last year. I am no longer uh, experiencing addiction with sugar. Um, I, I, I've, I've 
completely turned every, I changed my internal monologue that we were just talking about. I got rid of those voices in my head and I don't want people to think that it's because I took ayahuasca because Heroic Hearts did a wonderful job of integrating me with plant medicine, teaching me about mindfulness, teaching me about meditation, teaching me about breath work, teaching me about yoga, teaching me how to ground myself by going outside and walking barefoot in my yard or or whatever that looks like, showing me that just just what we put into our bodies matters, helping me reset my gut health because your gut is connected to literally every function in your body and it matters. And um, taught me how to sit with the emotions, how to truly feel and understand the emotions that I'm going through, um, which in turn changed my into- my internal monologue to allow me to not call myself a piece of shit and not tell myself I was lazy and not tell myself that I'm not capable. It taught me how to love and respect myself and change all of that to, I can, I will, I am capable of, I do love myself. I I have leniency on myself when I fuck up now, instead of oh you fucked up, you're the biggest piece of shit on the planet. You don't deserve to be here. And and sorry for the language. I'm an -hmm. an old school infantry guy. And Mm -hmm. this is truly the voice that was going on in my head. Mm -hmm. You're a piece of shit. You've quit everything you've ever started in your life. That's simply not true. Um, These are the things that were going through my head. Now it's, you will build that company. You will save veterans lives. You will, you know, get to where you're going if you just stay consistent and disciplined and love yourself and and have some leniency on yourself. Wow. What you have just said in two, three minutes is basically a blueprint for all of us to live by. And you that is exactly what has helped me to get through some very challenging times it very recently you're so right it is showing up it is actually taking ownership of your life and even if it rains down shit left right and center then there is still there are still choices that you can make every moment in time that will either pull you towards a relapse or towards a dark mood or towards, you know, a, a downward spiral into the abyss. Or you can take steps in the other way. And that's what I love to hear from you. I love absolutely every single thing that you have been saying because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And when it, it, it is a blueprint in, mm-hmm. in that by by doing those things you almost start to manifest your own destiny by taking responsibility for your thoughts and feelings and the way that you talk to yourself you become aware of those things and i'm not sitting here telling you that i don't still experience those things or i don't still call myself a piece of shit from time to time or but but what happens the best example i can give you is i I struggle with road rage. I hate Florida drivers. I just, I live in central Florida and we call it heaven's waiting room here because it's a significant geriatric population. And a lot of them probably have no business driving. I mean, if the speed limit's 70 miles an hour on the freeway and you're getting on it at 35 miles an hour, it's the quickest way to send me into a rage because it's not safe. But, and, and I will, I'll have outbursts when I'm driving and Immediately after I have that outburst, I say, Adam, what are you doing? Like, there's no reason for you to be angry right now. Just be present in the moment and the universe has a plan for you. There's a reason you're stuck behind this slow person. And then immediately it's gone. The thought doesn't go any further than that. I don't spiral into a rage and just be pissed off the rest of the day. I just let go of a thought that doesn't serve me. And it's, it's exactly, you're right, man. This is the blueprint to starting your healing journey and Mm -hmm. living a life that is just so full of joy and wonder and happiness. And it's just amazing, man. And, And if I can accomplish all of this in a year, I know everybody else can do it too, because I thought, you know, where I was at before I went on that trip last year was I was ready to check out. I was just done. I didn't want to be here anymore. Thank you for being so open. Thank you for being so honest, because 
too many men are not. And then we as a society paid a price uh, because the amount of youth suicides here in New Zealand, we had the second highest in the OECD. And the amount of suicides of men, of veterans, it is an epidemic, especially. So the, the, so and the veterans, at least there we have got figures and there we have got some statistics coming out. But what about all the other men that are affected by exactly the same principles? Whilst it might not be the same fate, it might come in different shapes and colors it doesn't matter the same principles are there starting with childhood problems poor coping mechanisms lack of insight no emotional intelligence and the feeling that they're helpless and hopeless both of which are lies that we keep telling ourselves but it's sometimes when you're in the darkness it's so hard to see that there are glimmers of light there, that there's, that there's actually hope out there. And we need to make a change there. And we all can make changes. I think the only reason that I'm, I'm at the moment still here and interviewing you is because I made those changes. I made those changes. I was willing to accept responsibility. It's definitely not my fault, all those things that happened to me. But it's my responsibility how I deal with that. It's my Correct. responsibility how I show up for myself, for my two sons, for the yes. people around me and the people who I have not even met yet. So it is, I think there is a purpose and there is a mission waiting for us. And many of us have no clue what it is and have not even discovered it yet. For you, this was a very harrowing journey. This was a brutal journey. How young are you? I'll Adam. be. I'll be. Uh, I'm 39. I just turned 39 in May. So bloody baby. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, statistically, that's middle age. If you look at Correct. it, I mean, yeah. most of us yeah. are getting to 80 when you're I lucky. Mean, the beard tells the story, man. It's, it's getting pretty gray these <laughs> yeah, days. That is salt so. and pepper. More salt and <laughs> yeah. pepper. Yeah. yeah. Why do yeah. you think I'm shaven? I had a beard like you, and and no, it was getting. I looked like freaking Santa Claus. No way. Uh, oh come on! Off, I can't off. wait for that. Day. I'm gonna own it, man. I'm gonna <laughs> own it for sure. <laughs> no, fair call, fair call. Uh, you're a slim Santa Claus now. So at 93, yeah. Look at you, 93 pounds. That's massive. 97. 97. 97. So, yes. Sorry, no yeah, undercutting I'm, there. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm proud of that one because shit, that's not a that's be. not a, stat a statistic I ever thought I would have to deal with in my well, life. Well, exactly. And, and exactly. uh, yeah, I did. I went from 311 pounds to 214 pounds. Wow. Okay. No, I'm at 50 pounds loss. Um, and I'm, I'm working on it. I must say there are, um, there, there is, there is still a little bit of a reliance on, on, um, on overeating. I need to say, call it overeating. I don't eat any ultra processed food. I, uh, my, I, my diet is very clean. But still, there is the, that 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 emotional hug that I still get yes. from food, and I yep. think that is the 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 thing where I say, okay, I could probably do better. But that at the same token, right now I'm going through hard times. Uh, okay, do you really want to strip off everything that at the moment feels good, uh, whilst I'm still working on all the good shit, uh, on all the good behaviors? You can't just throw all the toys out of the cot. Well, you can, you but is that is that easy? Nah. Will you set yourself up to fail? Yes. yes. Will you potentially spiral back to more harmful things? Yes. 100% you will. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything in moderation, baby steps, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. It is a journey. It exactly. is. And it's, it's, I want to be very clear with this stuff. And I think you'll enjoy this is this is a lifestyle change. This mm. is this is something that I will continue. I will practice all of these things from, mm. so I lost the weight through walking and fasting. I mm. fast on average 19 hours a day. That's mm. just what Wonderful. works for me. Yeah. I advocate for it because I know how powerful it is, but I know it's not for everybody. And there's, mm. there's no one size fits all, but from fasting to meditation, to mindfulness, to grounding, to breath work, I will practice all of these things till the day that I die. It's just, it's, it's no question for me. It, it's 
it's responsible for every positive change I have made in the last year. 100% agreed. And of course, that is very easy when you go to a retreat or when you have time off in your holiday or even on a weekend. But what do you do as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as someone who is standing on a production line? You know, if you do 10 hours work plus two hours travel, well, where the hell do you fit your your uh, mindfulness in there? Hmm. Well, you get you get out of your own way. You stop making excuses for your behavior and you build it into your schedule. You prioritize <laughs> yourself, not the TV, not the fucking phone, not whatever app you're going to scroll or, you know, you 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 very much have to be selfish in that. And this applies to anyone. I don't care if you have a wife and 12 children, or if you're in my situation where you just have a wife and two dogs, or, or if you're alone, you have to take responsibility for your own self care and actually put that first. And I mean that from mm -hmm. the bottom of my heart, you have to be selfish and work on yourself because when you start working on yourself and start seeing the progress, all of those other things in your life, they just start to fall into place the way that they should be. 100% true, 100% true. And it's very hard uh, because whilst you and I sit here and actually preach that and we actually do what we preach, most of the time <laughs> there are days and you don't yeah, feel of course. like like of course because we're human and 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 we're fallible and we're gonna mess up but we also mess up with grace and we give ourselves grace when we do that right like mm. you don't beat yourself up because you didn't you know i haven't been outside to ground myself today like i'm not mad at myself for that i'll get done with this and mm. i'll go out there and walk around for 15 minutes not mm. a big deal you know, but I know that that's something that's going to make me better. And it is hard. It's very hard to get out of your own way. But mm. I promise you, if I can do it, and I know this is cliche, if I can do it, anyone can do it. You just have to, <laughs> you, you just have to start. <laughs> that's true. And there is very much something to be said about gaining momentum, because when you when you make it a ritual, when you make, create habits that stick, uh, it is no longer that kind of first of January. I gonna get healthy now. I gonna do two thousand push-ups right. every day, and then by the ninth of January, you think, yeah, about that. Um, so now make small baby steps, and I think that's that's. You know, that's why I call it the, the five minute gardener. Uh, if you imagine you have got a garden and you from now on make the commitment that you spend every day five minutes in your garden, doesn't matter if it rains or shines, never more than five minutes, never less than five minutes, but consistently five minutes. After a week, you see a change. After a month, your family thinks, wow, the garden looks nice. And after three months, you get bus tours coming along where people actually check out your garden and say, whoa. So that is consistency. And that is the power of compound interest. And it's the same with those kind of things in our life that matter. Imagine that you are not so great with finances. But imagine that from now on, every day, you spend five minutes on your finances. Never more, never less. One day you look at an insurance thing. Uh, next day, you look at uh, how many takeaways did you have, etc. If you do that every day, can you imagine that maybe after three months, your understanding of finances will be very different? And that something that was previously scaring you is suddenly, oh yeah, okay, that you have dealt with it. Could that be that you're actually dealing with a trauma that in the past held you back? And now that you're actually facing your demons, uh, that suddenly things will change. I For sure. It will. A hundred percent. And, and I can use myself as an example of that. I used to think that I wasn't capable of doing anything because growing up, I had coaches and people, adults who were supposed to mentor you and show you the way, essentially do the opposite of that and tell me that I was never going to make anything out of myself. So I started to believe that. Mm -hmm. And then I read the book, Atomic Habits, and learned how to start <laughs> forming habits. And I... I know a lot of people refer to that book, but I'm telling you that book is so powerful because he starts you out so slow, mm. so very, very slow. He's like one minute of doing one thing one time a day. 
mm. turns into a lifelong habit. And so I do think that absolutely not forming those habits and not being able to get out of your own way is mm. a response to some kind of trauma that has happened to you in your life, mm. just based on personal experience and exploring all of my own bullshit that's been going on, you know what I mean? And figuring it out. <laughs> and that's a privilege. That's something that's a gift to us, men and women, or however, for the, however you describe yourself, we need to address nine. Let me rephrase that. You don't need to. You have got the privilege. You have got the, the opportunity to address those things that make you uncomfortable, that make you want to turn and run away. We have got a privilege in addressing those things. And we've got also the privilege of sitting still. We have got a privilege of actually just stop running. Running just <laughs> makes you die exhausted. <laughs> Old military meme. Um, <laughs> so uh, the I think the reality is stop running. Stay still. Close your eyes. Do some breathing exercises, learn how to use your diaphragm, calm down, calm your mind down. And then ask yourself the question, okay, how can I be the best version of myself? Ask yourself, what can I learn from my current scenario? Ask questions where solutions will become obvious because your brain knows the answers they're already sitting in there but they are just drowned out by all the the noise that bullshit that is going on by the other eighty thousand negative thoughts. well no, it's eighty thousand thoughts a day of which 80 percent are negative so that's about where you can normally put the typical human um and yeah we get drowned out by a lot of shit that is created in our own mind yeah it uh, we create it, our own stories and then we believe them. Oh, uh, isn't it? Isn't it? How much how much does journaling play a role for you? How much does actually putting these thoughts, these these crazy things into words? So I have to be honest and and I got called out on this on the podcast last week. I make excuses for not journaling. I hate writing. <laughs> I don't like to write. So journaling is not part of my practice. I right. do implement voice notes. Um, uh -huh. So when I take my morning walks, I will yeah. talk to myself on my phone and with Good. voice notes. Good. So um, and, and then I do that again at night. Um, I do use cannabis. I use cannabis uh, as a way to explore even more deeply the things that I need to deal with. But um, sometimes at night I'll come into this office, it'll be pitch black and I'll, I'll sit with myself and uh, I'll, I'll have conversations out loud with myself. Okay. So I, I think it does kind of take the place of journaling. However, it's not an excuse not to journal. And <laughs> I've been making excuses for journaling for no. far too long. So um, <laughs> it, it is definitely a practice that I know that I need to pick up and I, yeah. I think I will benefit from it for sure. Yeah. It certainly has helped me. Um, it's certainly uh, the first time when I, when I started now the other book, uh, when I started my steps to sobriety, the very first the first edition, um, four or five years ago, I had one day I had a writer's block. And I didn't know what to write I was sitting on my, my laptop there. I had no idea. And I, I forced me to do some crazy, uh, crazy writing, it's called, and you just type. The, there is a chicken over there and the sky is blue and whatever. It, you just write shit. And suddenly my fingers kept writing and I became a spectator. I sort of looked over and sort of thought, what the hell are you writing there? And out came truth. And I'm, I'm a, a fast uh, typer. So I was, it was like watching a film and something came out of my subconscious there where I thought, wow, I had never realized that. So that was something that happened to me there. And I became then so aware of the power of writing um, in releasing something that I didn't even know was there. And it's the same where, where many, many PTSD sufferers uh, come to art therapy, um, where suddenly you you bypass actually words because sometimes words are so hard to describe emotions, but you bypass mm -hmm. it and you put it uh, straight onto you know your canvas. 
um, there are many ways how we can actually bring those things out that we don't even know that they are there, but they are so important because they are subconsciously driving us often enough in the wrong direction. And for me, journaling is so powerful. Uh, it gives me, it gives me time. My thoughts are so fast and they're so nebulous and they're so all over the show, but they make me feel bad. And then when I actually take these thoughts, slow down because I have to write much slower when I write by hand, then suddenly I write those things down. And these thoughts, when I write them down, might actually be, eh, you really? I don't think so, um, <laughs> etc. So there are, I'm just putting it out there to, to everyone who is listening. There are so many ways how you can start to take leadership, ownership of your life, where you can start making a change. Uh, the, the habits is so important. And when you actually say, well, I, I, what shall I do? It's, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm, it's so much. Start with one thing. Have a glass of water. Have a right. glass of water right now. Just hydrate. Uh, because maybe, just maybe, part of your anxiety is actually your body saying, for Christ's sake, we're dying because you're dehydrated and you're you're my god i mean we, tomorrow we will be dead if you don't get any water in there that's your survival going on in there now hydrate yourself and suddenly you feel a bit better you feel a bit clearer in the head no that feels good uh maybe <laughs> don't don't go for the donut uh maybe get yourself something a bit more wholesome <laughs> something yeah, yeah. that is less spike of blood sugar crash of blood sugar <laughs> so yeah. when you start actually changing your your nutrition to something that is truly food being defined as something that actually encourages your body to grow and to prosper uh, rather than the about 80 90 percent of the supermarket items that shouldn't really be food uh shouldn't be called food um because they the, the the packaging is probably more nutritious than what is in there so <laughs> yeah, we, we've been duped we've been duped hard with that stuff isn't and, it and uh you, sugar i was i was i was uh, experiencing sugar addiction big time mm. i mean that's that's where 90 percent of my weight came from mm. and it's 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 really 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 bad it's so refined sugar is so bad for you and Absolutely. i had no idea i mean before i went on that trip i was basically a diabetic i was a diabetic Exactly. At 38 years old? Like, <laughs> ooh, that's probably not a good thing. You know, I mean, like, how long am I really going to live like that if I continue to do this? And, uh, and you know, I, I've taken it to the extreme. Um, for six months, I wouldn't let myself eat any sugar. I mean, I was checking labels on anything. If there wasn't, if there was added sugar in anything, it's not coming into my house. Well done. And uh, I, I, now I've definitely got it under control because if I eat, I ate a piece of cheesecake a couple of weeks ago and it was like, oof, this is not, I don't enjoy this. Like it tastes great. It tastes what? great, but, but yeah. just a normal person size piece of cheesecake, like one serving, like legit one serving made me almost sick at my stomach. It just didn't exactly. feel good in there. Exactly. And normally we have got about what, 2,400 calories, give or take per day. That's sort of a, a normal basis basic metabolic rate and, and stuff uh, that is probably quite all right for a man. Um, well, guess what? A cheesecake is more or less 2,400, 3,000 calories. And I, I don't mean a piece of cheesecake. Who eats one piece of cheesecake? No. Damn sure wasn't me. <laughs> I was exactly. eating half of the damn cheesecake for sure. You know, exactly. I mean, I mean, and it, it was even my wife is a phenomenal cook and baker and I love chocolate chip cookies. So she was constantly finding new chocolate chip cookie recipes to try. Oh. And, and so, I mean, it's not unheard of. Like there was a period of time where Monday through Friday in my house, there was fresh chocolate chip cookies every day. And that's and not good. It's not good for you, man. It is. It was her showing her love in her 100%. love language yes. for, to you so that was so you see the emotions that are happening here yes whilst we're talking sugar we are talking on your side receiving that emotional hug of the sugar also experiencing the sugar high which is pretty close to a cocaine or to an alcohol high etc we love it the dopamine flows we're feeling good 30 minutes later you're 
blood sugar is crashing because the insulin is being poured out from your pancreas and you're feeling like crap and your mood is low and you're getting anxious. Well, guess what? Yeah, you're feeding all your mental instabilities, your mental health issues. Da -da! Whilst on the same side, your, your wife is trying to love you and yep. seeing that you're in trouble and wants to hug you because that was probably how she received hugs from her mum. And that's a mistake that we do. If a child falls over and crisis is in the, oh, poor child, here's a cookie, um, <laughs> makes you feel better. So hang on, yeah. pain, sugar. Okay, that works. Okay, thank you. Thank you, grandma. Now that is fixed in my brain. And yeah. you're just, uh, how about just sit there and say, yes, it hurts, doesn't it? Yes. Let's just sit together here and I hug you and don't worry. It, it will get better soon. Hey, yeah, can you feel it? It'll stop hurting eventually. Exactly. Ah. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't need a sugar fix linked with that. So it's nope. that is how we can create change. You see already that we, by this little discussion about cookies, we have changed so much the narrative from cookies to, oh shit, emotional intelligence to habits, creating habits, changing habits. And that's so beautiful. And, and I mean, that's, that's, other hand, that's why I wrote, wrote, uh, and, and did the book, uh, Ask Me the Mindful Mouse, because it's so much easier. It takes you about 300 repetitions of a perfect form to create a habit in, in, let's say a sport. Uh, so 300 repetitions of that perfect curl or that perfect, whatever it is that you've got it so dialed in, it takes you about 3000 repetitions to undo a shit form into a good form so we might as well start good learn the right things and if you can do that with children now wouldn't that be a nice thing i think it's easier to teach children to be good men or good humans shall i say rather than repair broken adults yeah it's so easy to teach children how to be good humans because they haven't they haven't been through all the bullshit yet. <laughs> you you just need to understand, like, mm -hmm. giving your kid a cookie because he fell down and scraped his knee is not helping him <laughs> or her or mm -hmm. or them or wh whatever. Just like if if you know they're throwing a fit because they can't have the phone, don't give them the phone just so they shut up. Let them figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like a little adversity never hurt anybody, you know. Yes, all right. Adam, we both are uh, experiencing a little adversity. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. but then I love it what you say because if we two numb nuts can get our shit together, then I think there's real, <laughs> there's a fair chance for everyone else to do that as well. And everyone there will be... else can do this, my friend. Mm -hmm. Like, like, there's zero excuse that anybody has not mm -hmm. to just practice, just at a minimum, gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude is so powerful. If you if you want to change your perspective on the world or life or where you're at in life or your situation, wake up and say five things mm -hmm. that you're grateful for. I don't care if it's the sheets on your bed, the floor under your feet, the dogs in your mm -hmm. you know, your house. Just say say out loud five things that you're grateful for, and then email me, call me, text me, whatever you want to do. You know, DM me. And let me know how that made you feel, because I'm 100% willing to bet that the only way you can feel after you do that is good. Oh, 100% agreed. Adam, you're an amazing man. Uh, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, we seem to be twins in, in our experiences uh, and in our darkness, as well as in, in the light and in, in our resolution and conviction that we can make this world a better place by starting with ourselves. Um, yes, sir. This was so beautiful to to indulge in. This was pure yeah. indulgence, actually. <laughs> I'm addicted to making myself a better human nowadays. And you just allowed me that. You just actually gave me some messages that I needed to hear today um, to, to make this day not a pity party, but to actually go out there and accept responsibility, accept ownership, and create that, that strength by doing tiny little things, but in a consistent way. 
And so I thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for our discussion today. Uh, I th I thank you, man. I'm super <laughs> grateful you had me on. I, I, I could talk about this stuff for hours and hours and hours. Uh, this is my message. This is, this is what I do uh, every single day to try and help veterans here in the United States and all mm -hmm. over the world get better. And so thank you for, for indulging me in this conversation because that's, <laughs> it's pure indulgence, man. These are the conversations you, you talked about at the beginning substance, right? Like we need a conversation with substance and not just some bullshit that's out there on the internet. And so thank you for doing what you do, my friend. Well, if people want to know more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me uh, LinkedIn, uh, Adam Peters, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, also Adam Peters. Um, I have a website for my business called The Strategic Veteran, so thestrategicveteran.com. Um, that's pretty much it. The website will have everything you wanted to know about me on it. Um, and uh, reach out if if you got value out of this. If, mm -hmm. if you want to talk to me more and get more of my perspectives, I... I like to refer to myself as like a super connector or a professional networker. So I enjoy conversations. So please don't be shy. Don't be afraid. I don't bite. I will respond. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Guys, look down there into the description of the YouTube video and of the podcast because all of Adam's uh, information is down there. And once you're done there, please press the like and subscribe button. This is uh, a way of us growing the channel, of us feeling supported. Sometimes it, as a leader, you are more defined by the arrows in your back than actually by, <laughs> by the support. So every like and every comment uh, is much welcome um, for all of us out there who try to make this world a better place. So... Adam, again, thank you so much. And you guys out there, look after yourself and live with intention. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around.